Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, June 13th. This is Deacon Barry Taylor. Uh, we are in Unit 1, which is entitled, Jesus Teaches About Faith. Jesus Teaches About Faith. We're in Lesson 2 of Unit 1. And from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, our lesson title is Calming the Storm. Calming the Storm. Devotional reading is taken from Psalm 107, verses 23 to 31. Our background scripture is taken from Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. And Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to to 25 and those are parallel passages from three from the three synoptic gospels our printed passage and lesson passages or text is taken from matthew chapter 23 i'm sorry matthew chapter 8 verses 23 to 27 and our key verse from the king james version is chapter 20 sorry chapter 8 verses 26 which reads, Jesus saith unto them, Why are ye so fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the sea, and there was a great calm. Again, that's Matthew chapter 8, verses, verse 26. From the adult quarterly, our lesson aims, or number one, consider the feelings of the disciples when the storm overtook their boat while Jesus was asleep. Identi number two, identify the crisis that caused the adults to worry about themselves and their families. Uh, that caused adults, I should say. And then number three, respond to the promised presence of Jesus in bad times as well as good times. Um, after the introduction, our lesson, the Faith Pathway lesson, has three major divisions, or two, I'm sorry, two divisions. The first is entitled, Storms Come, and that's covered between Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 and 25. And the second is, Seek Christ, and that's covered between verses 26 and 27. From the standard commentary... Our lesson title is Delivered from Fear. Delivered from Fear. And very quickly, additional aims are, number one, recall key elements of Jesus' stealing of the storm. Number two, compare and contrast the text with the other little faith passages of Matthew. Uh, note, note, notably, uh, Matthew chapter 6 verse 30, chapter 14, verse 31, chapter 16, verse 8, and Luke, chapter 12, verse 28, in their context. And then number three, repent of an instance of a lack of faith, of a lack of faith. We have got a good lesson today. It's a familiar passage for most of us. Uh, and we're going to be discussing unreasonable fear. Uh, I would say uh, subtitle, uh, if you will, for the lesson uh, would be unreasonable fear. Now we all know that God gave us the emotional, the emotion rather of fear uh, for for good reasons. You know, there is a a, a fear uh, that. Uh, enables us to know when to fight or flight, uh, or a, there's a fear of uh, danger, imminent danger, that obviously uh, he gave us for the purpose of pre preserving our life and health. But there is an unreasonable fear that we are going to be discussing in our lesson uh, that basically uh, can do great harm and certainly to our faith and certainly demonstrates a lack of faith. That unreasonable fear is when there is no need to fear, and we're going to be focusing on that uh, as we discuss our lesson today. We're going to 
have a brief word of prayer. We'll give a little background, and then we'll get into our lesson text verse by verse. So, Father, we do thank and praise you again for, Lord God, blessing us in so many seen and unseen ways. We thank you for another opportunity to study your word. And, Lord, although we, we think it is a familiar passage, Lord, we can never be reminded enough how we are to trust in you totally and completely and we're to have no fear, Lord, as we place our complete trust in you uh, and, and, and realize that you are in control of all, Lord. And you have a purpose for our life. And, Lord, you're going to accomplish it through us, Lord, as we surrender our will uh, to you, Lord. So we just thank you for your loving care and your protection. And, Lord, we ask that you would increase our faith, Lord, so we would have no fear of things there there should be no fear of, Lord, as we trust again completely in you. We thank you for the hearers. We ask your blessings upon all those who are hearing, their families and their households. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, the background of our lesson uh, basically is uh, uh, something that Jesus uh spent a lot of his uh, time doing, and that is ministering to the towns and villages of Galilee. And Galilee was uh, the northern part of ancient Egypt, and it was so named because of the sea that it was adjacent to. Uh, and actually, that sea was, was actually a lake that was about 12 miles long and about seven and a half to eight miles wide. And uh, it was a uh, uh, a sea in which many uh, uh, sought their livelihood through fishing. In fact, many of Jesus' disciples were fishermen that fished uh, in the Lake of Galilee or Sea of Galilee, which is also uh, called the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, and uh, we know that uh, the disciples, uh, Peter and John and James uh, being among them, Peter and Andrew, his brother, John and James being among them, were skilled fishermen, perhaps very familiar with this lake, uh, familiar with the fact that uh, quick storms could come up. Uh, there were mountains uh, on the uh, west side of the lake that could obscure oncoming storms, uh, and so they could uh they could take some fishermen and, and uh, uh, lake uh, sailors, if you will, unawares and come up suddenly, and they could be very fierce. So our lesson uh, actually uh, begins with Jesus entering uh, a small boat with his disciples to go from uh, Galilee over to the other side, across the width of the lake to the other side. Uh, we don't find out until... Uh, later in the chapter beyond our, our lesson text that they're going to Gennesaret. Um, and we find out that uh, uh, we know that uh, if you read uh, uh, the, the first part of the chapter that Jesus has been healing and the disciples, his disciples, the twelve, have witnessed his miraculous healing power. And so they know that uh, he is operating uh, with the power of God. And, of course, their faith in him is being uh, increased. However, uh, it's not certain. In fact, we were pretty sure they don't know who he is at this point. Uh, they don't know that he is actually God incarnate. Uh, but Jesus is going to demonstrate in our lesson text today uh, that he is no mere man, no mere prophet. And I think that this is one of the uh, demonstrations that led Peter to confess later in the chapter, in chapter 16, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Uh, so we're going to uh, jump into our lesson text. But just before we do that, just a, a sampling of what Jesus uh, had done just before embarking uh, with his disciples to cross the Sea of Galilee. And before we do that, I, I, I should have mentioned that there were hills actually on both the east and west side of the Sea of Galilee that obscured oncoming storms from either direction. Uh, just before, again, Jesus uh, leads his disciples 
into the boat and across the lake. Uh, Jesus uh, demonstrates his, his healing power. If we look at uh, Matthew uh, chapter, and actually chapters between chapters 8 and 9, they focus largely on Jesus' miracles, which demonstrates uh, these, his authority and the, the fact that he is operating in the power of God, demonstrating the power of God uh, and doing things that only God could do. So Jesus uh, heals uh, a sick man, Matthew 8, chapter 5, uh, 8, chapter 8, rather, 5, to, verses 5 to 13. He cleanses a leper uh, in chapter 17, verses 12 to 19. Uh, and, and he uh, actually commands nature, as we see in our lesson text today. But Jesus has healed many at the, to this point. And again, his disciples perhaps believe that he is a, he's a prophet being greatly used of God, but don't understand that he is God incarnate. And so we're going to jump into our lesson text. Uh, we're going to read uh, the first division from the adult quarterly, which, which is entitled again, Seek Christ. And it uh, includes verses uh, chapter eight verses twenty six and twenty seven, and I'm going to read for the from the NIV version just for for clarity. And it reads, verse twenty six. He replied, "I'm sorry, I need to back up. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead here. Uh, the first division is entitled Storms Come. Storms Come, and the the verses." Uh, in that division are verses 23 through 25. And 23 reads, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Verse 24, Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Verse 25, The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. So we see Jesus actually leading his disciples to into the boat. They are following him. Uh, and uh, no doubt uh, he's told them uh, his intentions are to cross the lake. And But we don't find that out, and as I said, until later in the chapter, uh, that they're going to Gennesaret. And Jesus is perhaps exhausted he is he's human uh, Jesus uh, as as the man has worn out from teaching uh, and performing miracles and he is exhausted physically so he is asleep in the stern in the uh, rear part of the boat uh, the uh, and then a we see uh, verse 24 says and suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake. So the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Now, understand uh, some, I think the King James Version refers to the boat as a ship, but it was actually a boat. It was about uh, 27 feet uh, long, uh, about 7 feet wide. And uh, probably no more than four to five feet deep, four feet deep. And uh, so it was very easy for waves to sweep over uh, the bow into the boat. And, and by this time, there was probably water two feet or more in the bow of the boat. Uh, and, uh, and the storm is furious. The storm is raging. Um, Sorry, the boats were eight feet in width, 25 feet long. And again, um, the the storm appeared suddenly and was approaching uh, from either the east or the west, but it was obscured by the hills on both the east and the west sides of the lake. So uh, the disciples could not see it. And, and it, so it appeared to, to appear suddenly, but it was approaching. Uh, they just could not see it. It was obscured. Uh, and, of course, we know the King James calls it a, a, a tempest. Uh, uh, it's, it's also called a, uh, uh, 
it was called a uh, uh, something that uh, the the translation into English uh, equates to an earthquake. It was a dramatic storm, a uh, fierce storm. And again, these were experienced fishermen accustomed to storms, but this was one that apparently was particularly fierce, and they feared for their lives. They they did not think they were going to survive this. And, and as we know, it is natural for us to fear, uh, for us to fear even nature. Uh, God, of course, gave us uh, the instinct or the emotion of fear to know when to avoid danger, uh, impending danger. Uh, we know, for example, uh, we don't want to be out in a field when there's lightning all around. Uh, uh, God gave us good sense and <laughs> to know to take shelter. But in this case, uh, they are they are completely in the hands of, of God. There's absolutely nothing they can do, experienced as they were, to control the circumstance. And that is where, where we want to make a distinction between reasonable fear and unreasonable fear. Uh, we're going to say more about this as we get into the lesson, but uh, further into the lesson, but when you can control something, when you can uh, get out of harm's way, uh, then you do that. Your fear instinct that God uh, gave us is intended for that, to get you out of harm's way. But when you're in a situation where you have absolutely no control, you realize that God is controlling everything. You are completely, we are completely in his hands in every circumstance. And certainly in those circumstances, when you're out on a sea or a lake, and you have absolutely no control over nature. You 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 depend completely on God, and the and the and the and the measure of uh, faith or peace you can have, or the lack of fear, is directly proportional to the measure of faith you have in God. Okay, and now Jesus is with them. Jesus has demonstrated His power uh, that He is uh, operating uh, in the power of God. And they don't understand what his mission is now, but certainly uh, Jesus is on a mission that certainly hasn't been completed, and he is not going to perish, even as, as, a, as a man. He's not going to perish in this storm. We'll say more about that, as I said, as we go along. So verse 24b tells us, but he was asleep. And Jesus was, uh, Mark's account of this, uh, uh, this, uh, passage uh, tells us that he was in the hinder part asleep on a pillow uh, and that refers again as I said to the stern of the of the boat now obviously there was a lot of noise there was a lot of wind and and despite the fact that Jesus was exhausted uh, he had to have uh, some peace to sleep in those circumstances he had to not be fearful not worry about uh, what was going to happen to him to sleep under those circumstances. And you know, um, the Bible often equates uh, our ability to sleep with faith, with our faith in God and the peace that we have through that faith. If we look at uh, uh, Psalm uh, thir 3, verses 5, and then uh, 4 to 8, uh, and actually... Uh, when we keep our uh, Psalm, I'm uh, sorry, Isaiah 26 and 3 says he will keep us in perfect peace as we keep our minds stayed on him. So we, we know that uh, the extent to which we are trusting God for our welfare in any situation determines the measure of peace that we can have uh, in those uh, situations, even uh, during impending uh, situations of impending danger. So Jesus was trusting his father, again, as in his humanity. Let's understand now, he is, he is divine, and he shares all the divine attributes uh, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, but he has set those attributes aside so that he could become, uh, 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 so that he could take on flesh and suffer and die. So he is uh, subject to uh, what mere mortals are in the flesh, and so, but he is trusting his father, uh, whom he, he has submitted himself and his will to. He's on a mission that has not been completed, and he knows 
he is not going to perish in that sea. And that's one of the reasons he can sleep uh, very comfortably again in the flesh. OK, let's understand that in his humanity. I have to keep emphasizing that because, uh, you know, when the Bible tells us he was tempted in all points, like as we were tried in the flesh in all points, like as we are yet without sin, it means that he wasn't tried as deity. As God, he was tried in the flesh, but did not sin. The verse 25 reads, The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. Now, that tells us a couple of things. Number one, uh, obviously they were fearful. Again, their experience notwithstanding, this was this storm was something that they could not control. They could not roll fast enough to get to the other side to, to get out of it. Uh, they were completely uh, in uh, w without control. Uh, but they go to someone that they believe can help them, and that is Jesus. Again, Jesus has demonstrated himself to be uh, a miracle worker. And they go to him and ask him to save or deliver them out of this circumstance. They don't know how he's going to do it, but they woke him up and they said, uh, uh, save us. And, and one of the other passages, the parallel passages says, Lord, don't you care that we're dying? Aren't you, aren't you afraid, in other words? <laughs> but they, 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 they do go to him uh, because, it's, because it's, you know, you know, no other... Uh, possible source of deliverance from that circumstance in their midst okay so Jesus has demonstrated himself to be certainly a man of God uh, they believe perhaps at this point a powerful prophet of God and one who God's, God listens to and so they go to him and uh, for uh, his assistance or for his help in their uh, saving from this situation and they are convinced that they are going to drown otherwise. They say, we are going to drown. You know, by the way, Mark's uh, uh, passage, parallel passage, tells us, Mark 4.36, that there were other little boats as well. Uh, but we're only uh, focusing on the boat that Jesus and his disciples were in. We know when Jesus calmed the storm, he calmed it for uh, not only uh, the area that their boat was in, but the other little boats as well, because they all got to shore. Um, but yet again, we have to give it to the disciples. They knew where to go for help. And um, and they, while they acknowledged Jesus as, as a teacher, uh, they, and, and as I said, a, perhaps a, a powerful prophet, they did not recognize that he was equal to God at this point. And I should, I should say, even after Peter's confession, after the, this demonstration of power over nature, and after Peter's confession in Matthew 16, 16, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, uh, and, and which Jesus himself affirmed was the truth and it had come from God, uh, they waffled in understanding who he was, uh, after that, if we look at chap Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 27, they're still confused about who he is and what his mission is. They don't understand that fully until after his death and resurrection as to who he really is and what his purpose was for coming. I want to say um, something. We, you know, oftentimes uh, the way the Holy Spirit... Um, God through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit draws us uh, to faith is by uh, bringing us to the in, to the end of uh, what we are capable, what we think we're capable of controlling in our lives. He brings us to the end of ourselves. It brings us into a, a, a powerless situation uh, where there's no recourse but to lose all hope or to trust God, one who can bring us through whatever that great trial is or whatever that circumstance is. Um, and again, that's when we demonstrate the faith that God wants us to have 
And that faith, again, is one that produces a fearlessness. Um, I, I recall, and I often recite this to myself when I have a tendency uh, to think about being fearful of anything. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, where in that first chapter, uh, God reminds Joshua three times to be strong and very courageous. Uh, be not dismayed. Uh, he tells them not to be fearful for the, and, and he tells them why. Okay, the re why not be fearful for the Lord thy God is with you, whithersoever you go. So we don't uh, trust ourselves to deliver ourselves out of fearful situations or, situ or trying situations uh, that could be fearful. We trust God. We trust God to deliver us and to sustain us. And, and when we do that, uh, we can have a peace that surpasses the understanding of this world. Uh, we know Philippians 4, 6 and 7 tells us to be anxious for nothing or to be worried about nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving to make our requests known unto God and the peace of God, which passes understanding will keep our hearts or garrison our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That is what God wants us to do, not to be anxious, not to be fearful. Certainly he wants us to exercise natural, the natural instinct to avoid danger or harm, but not to be uh, dreadful or fearful of things we have no control over. So let's move into the second division of our lesson which is entitled Seek Christ. And that's covered between Matthew chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Again, I'll read from the NIV. And it reads, He replied, You of little faith, why are you so f afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. Verse 27, The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So back up to verse 26. So Jesus replied to them when he gets up out of his comfortable nap in the midst of the storm. He rebukes them. He rebukes them for having little faith. And, and by this time, they should have seen enough to recognize who Jesus was, the promised Messiah, the Son of the living God. In fact, uh, God incarnate, they should have been able to do that. But even if they only recognized that he was a powerful prophet being greatly used of God, uh, they should have trusted him, uh, that trusted that God was not going to allow them to perish and him to perish uh, because of the work that God had called him to do. But anyway, so at, by this point, we know Jesus expected them to have greater faith. We know several places, several other places in the gospel, he rebukes, rebukes them for their little faith. And he says, if you had faith as small as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, be thou removed to hinder place, and it would be removed. So he is he's really chastising them for their little faith. And I, and I think we need to examine ourselves, and I believe the Lord wants us to examine our faith to see uh, if we have it, any, and how much we have. Uh, and, and, and I believe that is certainly one of the primary purposes for trials in our lives, you know, to demonstrate to ourselves, not to God, but to demonstrate to ourselves how much or how little faith we have or what, we're, what we have faith in. I mean, do we have faith in... When things get really bad and, and drugs or alcohol or the wisdom of someone else, or do we have faith in God? And that is what trials not only are demonstrated or are intended to demonstrate the state of our faith, weakness or strength, but also to strengthen our faith as we, uh, as we, God brings us, delivers us through trials, our faith grows or it should grow. And we should remind ourselves uh, often of what God has brought us through uh, when we are facing new trials. You know, God has brought me through uh, many, many years of and many, many trials. And so new trials, even though uh, it, the, the, the newest one might be more fierce than all those before, 
God has grown our faith, as he did Abraham's over some 25 years from his call in, in Ur of the Chaldees to the time when, when his faith was perfected, when he was about to offer his son Isaac uh, to God. God grew his faith through trials. So we're going to go on um, to, to now. So, again, he chastises them, and then he goes on, and he rebukes the winds and the waves. In other words, he commands the winds and the waves. Just as God uh, commanded the uh, the seas to cover the earth, uh, Jesus commands them to, to be calm, this lake to be calm and the winds to still. Uh, so he demonstrates the power of God over nature, over his creation. Uh, and how do they react to that? Uh, verse 20. Six uh, tells us the men were amazed. They were awestruck. They were astonished, uh, and they recognized this is no mere mortal man that has command over nature, over the wind and the waves. And so they asked themselves one to another, "What manner? What kind of man is this? What kind of man could this possibly be that has?" command of the wind and the waves now i would think that you know the 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 obvious answer to the question is this is no mere man this is god this is and and they may have thought at this point that it was still god acting through uh a prophet a powerful prophet we know that he parted the red sea by the hand or rod that Mo, he gave moses and so maybe they're remembering that but they will come to realize that this is no mere man uh, in fact, again, they don't fully realize that until his resurrection. He, he, he told them that he had power to lay down his life, and he had power to take it up again. He said, no man taketh my life. He laid his life down, and he took it up again. And when he rose from the dead, if nothing else had convinced them to that point, his raising himself from the dead demonstrated that he, in fact, was God and had power over life and death. And I'd like to read a, um, a paragraph from the uh, Standard Commentaries, uh, from the Standard Commentary that says, Jesus challenged the disciples to let their faith grow to fit the magnitude of the Lord's power and his gracious goodwill to use it on their behalf. That's what we want to, that's what we want to keep in mind. He says, elsewhere, Jesus taught that faith as a grain of mustard seed could move a mountain. That's Matthew 17, 20. Little faith has potential, but in this case, fear weakened it. Fear weakens our faith. As a matter of fact, they're diabolically opposed. Again, I'm not talking about the natural instinct that God gives us to avoid danger. I'm talking about unreasonable fear. Uh, over things that we have no control, that only God uh, can control. And so um, I think our, our, our main takeaway here is for us to realize that, uh, that God uh, desires complete trust, our complete trust in him in every circumstance. Uh, he desires that we uh, realize that he knows every circumstance, every situation, uh, and and that he is going to always do what's best for his children. From Romans chapter 8, we read, uh, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? And we know that's not all things that we stand, that we desire. I mean, every trifle that we might desire but it's everything that we stand in need of god wants us to realize you know uh if if we uh, sinful men uh know how to care for our children he certainly knows how to care for his and he will care for his and he will always do what's best for us so he wants to bring us to a place of trust a place of fearlessness again a natural fear is over those things that we have no control those fears that can cause us uh, great harm, uh, anguish, uh, mental anguish, uh, sickness, uh, even death. You know, he wants us uh, to trust him and again, 
be fearless. This is a fairly short lesson today. We just had a few verses, but I trust that uh, we perhaps added a little additional insight. I know, again, it was a familiar passage, uh, and we know that, again, I, well, I believe, you know, uh, Jesus, uh, God, uh, the Father, uh, perhaps uh, allowed these trials uh, in the lives of the uh, disciples that would become apostles uh, allowed them to experience these along with Jesus so that they would fully realize uh, who he was uh, so that they would uh, understand his mission and again uh, carry on his mission after his ascension so again we, we pray that uh, again this lesson has been helpful we're going to close in prayer Lord we do thank and praise you again and Lord we pray that you'd help us to be bold and fearless Christians Lord uh, uh, certainly not fearing anything we have absolutely no control over Lord we know that uh, we are to exercise good judgment when it comes to impending danger but Lord we know also uh, we're to trust you in everything and for everything and, and as we do Lord we can have that peace that passes understanding we just thank you for it Lord we thank you for being our deliverer from delivering us from the penalty of sin, from the power of sin, and ultimately you will be you will deliver us from the very presence of sin, Lord. We ask your blessings upon all the hearers of this lesson. We pray always for greater understanding, and as we understand your word, Lord, we pray for greater faith, and as you increase our faith, we pray for greater obedience to your word and will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.